That's a traditional scream of the microphone as an invocation to Jason's session. <laughs> And uh, yes, a spoke in the wheel, a book by Amita Garikar. We have Amita in uh, conversation with Jason. Jason is a legal anthropologist. He's a student of sociology and law. He's one of our leading public intellectuals, and his editorials in the Herald and other dailies in Goa are quite well celebrated. I read them rigorously. <laughs> and he's got this wonderful blog called Notes from an Itinerant Mendicant. Right, yes, I We got their pronunciation right. And all his writings are collected and compiled under that uh, blog. So it's wonderful. It's accompanied by some beautiful illustrations and drawings and photographs of he deems fit to accompany that. Amita is an architectural historian and a novelist. She teaches at uh, the Goa College of Architecture. She is currently in the middle of two book projects, one on the architecture of the Portuguese seaports from Goa to Bombay, and another, a novel set in the Mughal era. She has also published essays on the architecture of the Ikerian Nayakas of Western Karnataka, and is a regular columnist in the Goa Press on issues of history, housing, and settlement. Uh, over to you, Jason. Well, thank you, uh, Zay, for uh, those introductions. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, the release and uh, release of uh, um, the second edition of, of Amita's book, A Spoken Wheel. Um, and welcome, Amita. Um, I have to confess that uh, when I when I, did the, when I ha got the first edition of uh, A Spoke in the Wheel, I held on to it for around seven months and kept looking at it and thinking to myself, oh my god, another Buddha story, I don't think I can deal with this. So I, I put it on, uh, I put it off for as long as I could. But once I picked it up, um, I leafed through it. Um, perhaps over two days and made sure it was done because it was literally unputdownable. Um, in brief, the story is um, a recounting of the life of the Buddha by a Buddhist monk, Upali. I particularly liked Upali because he seemed a little bit like me, always faithful. I'm creating trouble or unable, unable to uh, just take things as they are asking terribly uncomfortable questions um, and butting in when they really shouldn't. Um, but uh, enough about the book and my version of the book. Um, and Amita, why a story on the Buddha? Why did you choose um, this theme as uh, the first story to tell? Uh, it didn't begin as a novel actually. It began as a it began as a discussion uh, a long time ago, uh, mid 90s, late 90s, um, into why social revolts or social rebellion um, doesn't really succeed or doesn't often succeed in South Asia. That uh, you know there have been so many attempts to change society, and yet we find uh, ancient social evils. You know you can name so many of them, Sati, for example which is really ancient and you can still find it in the contemporary world. So why, why, why isn't it that we can say, look, this was the past and that's all horrible. Today we have, we are in a new age. It's like we carry everything with us. We carry all the baggage, all the horror in many ways with us. So there was a discussion actually at that time um, in the context also of the dying of, you know, in some ways of the dying of the left movement in Bombay uh, in the 90s. So I started thinking about what happened to, the, what happened to some of these movements and, uh, and I thought of Buddhism as being um, one of the earliest movements that tried to change society. Um, so I started reading about it and, and, and uh, while reading about it I decided that okay I'll make a novel of it. Because uh, one, I, I, I uh, am not equipped to read the original sources. I don't have a Pali 
I don't have Sanskrit, of course, but I don't have Pali more importantly. Um, so I couldn't read the original sources. What I read were the secondary sources, were the writings by scholars. So uh, in that sense, I, I didn't come up with anything original. But I came up with a lot that, um, that made me uh, think again, you know, that made me realize, change my opinion on a lot of things. And so I thought, um, why not write about it? And if I write it as a novel, because I, I, I like to read novels and I, and I like to read thrillers especially, and I thought if I could make it into an attractive novel, uh, it would be, it would attract a lot of people, like for example my students. Of course, it has not been that, I mean, it's, it's too much of a tome, so it hasn't attracted the younger generation that much. But that was the idea, I guess. Okay. Um, so, thank you, Amita. One of the things I, I appreciate about the book is, 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 it that, is that the telling is a very visual uh, quality. Um, one of the images that I particularly have in mind is when Upali meets with the Emperor Ashoka. Uh, and when he does so, he has he's taken up into this tower. Um, in my mind, there's an elevator, but I believe that be. But he goes up. Is there an elevator? There is an elevator. It's not just my mind. Um, it's taken up in an elevator until they reach the very uh, pavilion at the very top. And the description of it is, is very, very weird. It's very immediate. You feel like uh, you're actually there. Um, but having read that, Amita, uh, and because writing historical fiction is always so difficult. I mean, I've read some amount of historical fiction, and you can always tell when the person is just faffing. Yeah. Um, and this doesn't really seem like faffing. So what were your sources, I mean, what did you read to be able to produce this kind of uh, very real, uh, uh, a vivid description of uh, the milieu? Uh, actually, I would say there's almost no faffing in the book. It's, it's, it's actually history, it's, it's palatable history. It's, it, that's, that was the idea. There is no invention of uh, anything except uh, Except the the lead character maybe and his you know and a couple of course even even the even the secondary character and the, and the main lead of course Buddha and uh, Shoka are, are historical figures so it's it's actually palatable history it's not uh, it is isn't it isn't that much of fiction uh, so yeah so what I read was um, uh, was uh, practically everything that postgraduates uh, studying ancient India would have to read I think um, ancient India and and Buddhist history. So I, I read all the all the you know textbooks and high level textbooks and whatever I could find. And actually I did most of my research at JNU. So I had the benefit of speaking to the faculty there, uh, the faculty of ancient Indian history, and they gave me you know a lot of help in terms of what I should read. So I spent a month or two at the start of my research at JNU, and yeah, that, that was how I began. So uh, even the small details. Uh, are actually uh, they have they have a source. So the problem, of course, of writing, of writing fiction that you don't give your sources, you don't have footnotes, and you don't have references. But one would really like to because there are small things which are uh, which you know came out of came out of uh, people's research. And to me, they were actually very exciting at that time. Like for example, uh, you know, while people were actually reading it, because when you read a novel, you don't notice a lot of details. At least I don't notice a lot of details. I tend to just rush through because you're, I tend to get caught up in the story. So, you know, if there are paragraphs on description, you just jump over, I, I jump over it. But uh, for me, while actually finding out stuff about the context, it was really exciting. Like, you know, I remember stirrups, you know, the fact that st stirrups were, when you ride a horse, you use stirrups. Stirrups were invented in South Asia and they were invented in the Mauryan period. I still remember when I read that somewhere, I was so excited. You know, and then it spread from here and they were actually toe holders. People put their big toe in because people rode barefoot. So they put their big toe in and that's how and that's how they could ride the horse. So before that you had chariots, otherwise you'd be you'd be flung off a horse. So that was really exciting and I put it in, in a, you know in a couple of in a, in a dialogue actually and nobody so far has ever noticed it, but that was like my wow moment, you know, stood up. So so yeah, so there were lots of these finding out about uh, about things and, and lots of articles and uh, uh, and uh, writings that that, uh, that made a huge difference. Uh, broadly, if you look at the main writers whose um, work I have used, I would say Ramila Thapar and Devi Prasad Chattopadhyay at that time for the first edition. Besides, of course, lots of others, but these uh, these two writers, I think I read everything that they have produced because they really focused on the on ancient India and the ideas of the time. 
So yeah, and then Iqbal Singh and uh, Didi Kosambi, of course, and some others who have written about how you look at history. And then for mythology, this was this of course not the details, but this is the ideas for the context of mythology. I read some anthropologists and, and so on, like Lanoi and, and David Campbell and so on. Uh, so you mentioned the first edition and uh, the second edition, which, uh, the book is here by the way, um, and I believe it falls on me to urge all of you to go out and buy, a buy yourself a copy, not just buy a copy for yourself, buy a copy for others and give them, give them, give them away as Christmas gifts. Um, so this edition has been brought out by Navayana. Um, tell me, Amita, is there a difference between the first and the second edition? And so, oh, oh, okay. And, and this is the first edition. Um, you can maybe you can see why it took me so long um, to open the book. Um, but um, what are there any differences uh, beyond the, the publisher? Um, the change in publisher, is there a difference between uh, the two books? Yeah, there is a difference. Uh, I would be, uh, to me there's a huge difference, uh, which is why it's called an edition, but I would be interested in people who have read the first book uh, telling me what they think. Uh, actually, almost immediately when the book, not almost immediately, actually at the moment when I saw the published version, I had, I wanted another one, you know, because I had lots of problems with it. Um, which the publishers know, so I, I don't have a problem. Harper Collins was the publisher for this, and I um, I was not happy with what they did. They didn't uh, they didn't edit it well, so there were there were blunders on every page. It's probably because you know you're a small fry, and they had a lot of big books coming out at that time, so they didn't um, they didn't proofread it. I think this is my so I had a huge problem on the day I saw the final. Then they reprinted it. In the reprint, there are less mistakes. But at that time, there were I could see mistakes on every page. So there was that problem. Then there was no map. Um, um, yeah, so at that time it was these two. There was no map and, and there were lots of uh, small errors which added up to a lot of big errors, you know, uh, overall. I mean, somebody who's obsessed with these kind of errors uh, counted and, you know, made a record and told me there are 100, 187 errors uh, in the book. But anyway, so, uh, so that was my first um, reaction. But then over time, and this came out in 2005, over time, um, my opinion also has, um, I wouldn't say changed, but it has developed. It has developed on a lot of things that were written at this time because I got more interested in the, in the issue. See, this, this book looked at, um, at uh, the origin of caste society and the Buddha's response to it. So a lot of the issues that, I mean, all the issues practically that are taken up in the new book, all the, the story itself, all the characters, they're all there. But there's a fine tuning. There is a, there's a streamlining, there's a sharpening of some arguments. I have been reading much more uh, about caste in the last um, nine years, ten years, whatever. Uh, in fact, I would say, and I said this in the acknowledgments, to put it in a, to put it in a nutshell, uh, the first edition is based on uh, Marxist interpretations of Buddhism. And the second edition is based on Ambedkarite, or the changes are, are based on Ambedkarite interpretations of Buddhism. This is what I, how I would summarize it because I've been reading Ambedkar, uh, Ambedkar himself and uh, Ambedkarite writers like for example Kanchayalaya, uh, Kanchayalaya and Rajaranjan Mani, these are two writers who uh, have influenced the new edition a bit. Also uh, today there's a, you know, thanks to social media, there's a lot of stuff online which is, you know, tr makes tremendous reading. And uh, about a, for about a year now, I've been reading the writing on this web, uh, Ambedkarite website called Roundtable India, which has tremendously radical writing, challenging a lot of uh, a lot of tropes, a lot of dearly held ideas um, of India. So these these writings have uh, influenced the new edition a lot. And in my opinion, it's it's like a huge it's 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 made a huge difference. But like I said, the basic story, what's happening, events, all that has not has not changed. But um, but sharpening, emphasis, deletions of small things because you know I didn't want to make it fatter. In fact, that was one of my problems with the first book. It was so fat. I I would have liked you know a book half the size, actually half the size. You know, 100 pages or 150 pages would have been ideal. So I was thinking that when I do the new edition, I'll like cut it down by half, but it didn't work. So. Um, 
So what I have done is I have to delete some some things in order to bring in uh, some new ideas. But basically, it's the ideas and the tone and the you know and the, and the fine tuning and, and the sharpening. That's that's the change. It's not uh, it's not anything huge, but yet to me it is huge. It, it reads to me very differently now. You know, there, there are things that, that were there, but I mean, a lot of things that were there, like Kancha Elaya's idea of Buddhism as a political philosophy. It is, it was there, and the things that he says, you know, the thing, the quotes that he discusses in his book, uh, were there earlier. But I, I just, you know, I, I, thanks to reading him and reading a lot of his writings, uh, you know, my perspective on that has sharpened. I feel I understand it better, and as a result, I have sharpened things there. So, yeah. Uh, it also went through a literary, um, two literary editors at Namayana, uh, who um, who really did a solid job of not just proofreading, but you know, criticizing the writing, telling me, you know, do you mean this when you're saying this, or do you mean that? And that was very, it was very interesting, very exciting, very uh, self-critical, you know, to say that look at your gaze here and look at your gaze there, and you know, this kind of thing that literary criticism does. Uh, so yeah, so the. So some of the writing, the, the the language has changed as a result of of that literary criticism that you know that they did. Uh, Navera has uh, generally has. I mean, I, I have not seen the this book. I have not opened the opened it actually. But generally, their quality of uh, production is high. The the proof, you know, books tend to have their books tend to have almost no mistakes. So. Uh, so yeah, so I can see, and they they worked really hard on it. They took one and a half year steadily working on it. You know, not not that they just kept it aside. They worked on it steadily. So, so that's also kind of nice. Yeah, and I and I do feel as Alito had once told me that uh, he's sitting at the back there that I'm very lucky to have a second chance to change my point of view. You know, to when most people don't get that. Once you're out in print, you're out in print. So yeah, I, I am conscious of that. So it's, I'm very fortunate to have this chance to. I mean, some people have done it, especially playwrights like Bertolt Brecht. He continuously changed his plays, and, you know, improved them. But I think with novels, normally they come out and they're done. But yeah, unfortunate. Which is why one should have a blog, maybe. Uh, of course, not for <laughs> novels, but for shorter writings. One can always uh, rework what has come out in print and then put another version, which you can then keep on working and, and improving. Um, Amita mentioned uh, the, the influence of Ambedkar, I thought, on her work. And uh, as it so happens, uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, we will be having a Ambedkar um, um, well, yeah, scholar uh, by the name of uh, Dr. Varsha Ayer, who will, be, uh, who will present the first Ambedkar Memorial Lecture. Uh, and subsequently, on the 7th, again at 1 o'clock, we have uh, Mr. Chandraban Prasad, who will present the second uh, Ambedkar uh, Memorial Lecture at Gal. So, if, if you are interested in these themes, and I would urge you to be, um, 1 o'clock is, um, when, when is, is an appointment, a date you should make. Um, coming back to the book, uh, Amita, so why should people read uh, the spoken way? This, I know this sounds like American art style, but say Obviously, I don't think people have to read the book. Um, but what it is, basically, to summarize the book, it's a demystification of myth. Now, if I have to summarize the book, it's a demystification of uh, the Buddha legend. Um, you know, a, a lot of what passes for historical fiction, not all of it, of course, but some of it, not the best, um, is, is mythification. You know, you add stuff, you add, you add what you think is interesting and so on. You say, okay, this did not really happen and, you know, I, I put these two events together because it made it more interesting for my story. But this is, a, this is a history lesson, actually. It's a history lesson and a demythification of the Buddha legend. And I think that's really important. And, uh, in India, in Goa, where we tend to mythify everything, you know, we are so fond of myths. I mean, it's so normal for people to say, oh, you know, 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, you know, this happened, that happened, this was written, the Vedas are, you know, you can have, you can have uh, educated people saying the Vedas were probably written 20,000 years ago. So there is, I think, uh, history has just not reached people, you know, people are, people are content to live in 
in uh, in myth, in myth and legend, and you know, I mean, it's the stuff that is said about Shivaji, for example. People are just content to live in in popular histories, which are really, which is really rubbish. So, uh, so in that sense, it's um, I mean, I, I I think that is its only importance that it is a demythification. One can learn about ancient India, how it actually was, because it has been read by some historians and uh, including Romila Thapar and. Dian Jha and some others who have felt that it's really, you know, it's a, it's a good portrait of how life would have been at that time. So that, that's, uh, that's After I read the book for the first time, I honestly felt, maybe also because of its really visual character, that it, this book really needs to be converted into a film. If there's anyone here who has filmic connections, I would urge you to pick up the book and, and read it and uh, get in touch with Amita for the rights. Uh, you know, when one asks a question, one always also has an answer in one's head, right? Uh, and the reason maybe I asked the last question, Amita, is because after reading this book, what a Buddhist history of India, a, 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 a focus on Buddhism and the, and, the, uh, and the politics around it could offer us today for re-understanding Indian history. Uh, is what this yes. book offered. I mean, after that, I went like a maniac and started reading as much on Buddhism as I could get. But also, I think I was really lucky because I ran into work. I uh, like the work of, uh, is it Ramil? Inden. Inden is, uh, uh, I forget the name of the text. Uh, but the manner in which um, Buddhist political theory uh, structured uh, the, empire, uh, the, the, the empire, which is radically different from uh, a, a Chanakyan uh, uh, political theory and it struck me that we um, there is so much that one can learn in terms of restructuring India if one looks at, at, at Buddhism uh, instead of going into this Brahmanical way of, of looking at stuff I mean in the West Machiavelli is a name for a kind of evil manipulative not nice in India, we have no problems in celebrating uh, Chanakya as as the Indian Machiavelli. I mean, something has to be really wrong for you to celebrate evil and celebrate manipulation. Uh, but there you go. Um, I was warned some time ago that uh, we are running out of time. So before I wrap up and uh, thank Amita, uh, maybe I um, open up the floor to maybe two questions. So if, if there are, yes. Is that all right? Does it work? <laughs> um, I hadn't realized that you were going to be speaking here today and the book that I chose to bring with me to India for this month was this one. <laughs> so when I realized that you were going to be here, I was very happy indeed. Um, it's the first uh, version. I don't know if I should possibly skip it for the second, but anyway, uh, and I'm loving it so far. I haven't finished it, but uh, I, it's, uh, it's, I recommend it. <laughs> um, the question I have for you is, um, do you think it has made a difference? Do you think it brings a kind of a new perspective or a freshness um, to, to this particular story, you being a, a female writer, or do you not see yourself in that way? Do, are you simply a writer? Um, I think I'm simply a writer. I, I think this is one of the things that I have uh, maybe grown a bit. Today, I would say I'm more conscious of myself as a female writer. But when that edition, I was just a writer. I was just somebody who was interested in history. At least I was not conscious. Of course, I was a female writer, but I wasn't conscious of it. Now I am. So now, yeah, that is one of the things. That is one of the things I thought about. You know, I thought about. Um, I thought about as I was looking at the final stuff here. But yeah, uh, I, I did not see myself as a as a female writer, or even now, I'm, I'm more interested in caste issues and Ambedkarite politics than I am in gender issues. So, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not that strong, yeah. I, I yeah, anyway, uh, just to add to what Jason says, I do think this is another important thing, not that the book plays such a great role, but I do think it's very important that we look at Indian history from this different strand that uh, rather than, you know, people always talk about the Vedas and the Upanishads and so on, there's always this Brahminical idea of India's past, but there's so much more. You know, Buddha, Buddha offers a completely contrasting view of life, right? From, you know, the legend doesn't tell you why he, propose certain things, why beg, what was his idea of politics, 
and it's very it's very counter to uh, brahmanical ideas of the time i mean his his idea of what of what a king was it matches you know it's very close to frederick engels you know the communist idea of what a king was he says it's a maha sammata that's a, it's the great elect and it happened because because after the rise of private pro property and the individual family people started fighting over you know started fighting for uh, individual growth and they needed somebody to control the fight so you know it's really it's it's really interesting and politically radical his ideas and not just him but not just buddhism but at the time there is lokayata there is the jainavad today you know we see jainism as as what you know as this thing that's happening in palitana for example or whatever but jainism was very radical at its time and it offered a lot of new ideas so that is another thing which i think is important that we look at other strands of indian thought which actually run through indian history we don't just look at at uh, hindu spirituality as being india's contribution to thinking it's been tremendous a tremendous a very very powerful other ideas which have been kind of ignored and less ignored today than they were at some time but you know we still have time for one more uh, intervention if anyone would like to yeah <coughs> yes as an art historian and writing on political Uh, structure. I have read the book, and now I'm very curious. Uh, what that have painted now that you've talked about that she took you through the places and and it was very light. Uh, how would that shape in terms of our physical environment um, going into parallel history of India? And why is it that, in your opinion, through this phase, that we are kind of shy of our history in totality? in my perception i don't know if you would agree that uh, there is whether we can cope with it or not that's not the thing but the question really is that as an art historian and writing on political arena of india uh, is it segregated or is it combined or architectural historian yeah uh, i don't think it's segregated at all i mean whenever i i've been teaching architectural history for many years now and i've always talked about the politics of it I've always talked about the social content. In fact, that used to be my that used to be my thing. That I was, you know, spending a lot of time on the political and social content of architecture. So, for example, so I mean, in, here when I speak about, you know, what's known as Buddhist architecture or Ashokan Ashokan architecture, you know, not just the palaces but those Ashoka stambas and the and the rock cut architecture, the cave architecture that came up. I mean, this is stuff. Uh, about about the politics of which I have always been interested and in, and in, in discussing. I think you can't really understand it. You know, I mean, why cave architecture? Why did Ash why did Ashoka launch what finally became 1,500 years of rock cut uh, temples and shrines in India? I mean, he had a he was a he was a very political guy and he had a, he had a political vision. And this is what we discuss in class as well. You know, what is this vision that created those those uh, monolithic pillars? You know, with those animal figures on top on top. So. Yeah, no, I never found it different. I think it's really important to understand when you understand architecture. Also, if you want to understand architecture, to understand its politics. Architecture has always been about politics, really. You know, especially when patronized by the big guy. That brings us to the end of the session. Um, so I will uh, end by thanking Amita for the wonderful series of responses, and uh, to all of you for being such a wonderfully attentive audience. Thank you. <laughs>